Good evening to all of you. I'm Rita Hauser, as most of you know, and it's a great pleasure to have you here for what we're counting now as the seventh of an annual series that we have sponsored by the Hauser Foundation. And the aim of this series is to pick a relevant subject and bring to the halls of the council uh, analysts and people of knowledge from other institutions similar to ours so that we can get an exchange that isn't just American-centric, but presents these very issues from a different perspective. And we have had, in the past, some very interesting partners, the Institute for uh, Strategic Studies in London, St. Anthony's Middle East Institute, the Lowy Institute last year from Sydney, Australia, on subjects of China. We've had a variety of others discussing terrorism and looking at it from a different perspective than our own. And it is really, even for me, very interesting to see how others see the world differently than we do. So I hope you'll enjoy it and get some education. Uh, we have here some extraordinary people this evening and particularly tomorrow because we have representatives this time not of one particular institution but of a variety of them from the Polish Institute of International Affairs, the German Institute for International and Security Affairs, the Center for European Neighborhood Studies from Budapest, King's College London, the French Institute on Foreign Relations, and Brookings. So you're going to get a wide variety of views tomorrow. This evening we have two ambassadors and one on the way, but it is my great pleasure to introduce for you our uh, interlocutor who will take the microphone and have a conversation here with two ambassadors. So I'm pleased to introduce to you Lee Feinstein, one of our own, a former U.S. ambassador to Poland, and now Dean of International Studies at Indiana University in Bloomington. So if you gentlemen will come up to the podium, Lee, and our two ambassadors, welcome. Welcome, it's nice to be back uh, at the council. Um, uh, thank you, Rita, We're, there you are. Thank you, Rita, for um, your uh, leadership on global issues, for your years of support of initiatives inside and outside academia, and for your counsel over the years to the United States government. We are all very grateful. And I'm very pleased to be joined by uh, Matthew Rycroft, the British uh, perm rep uh, to the United Nations, who, in addition to a career in leadership positions uh, in the FCO, was once uh, seconded uh, to the U.S. Congress and lived to tell the tale. <laughs> just for a few weeks. <laughs> See, uh, just a few weeks. That's how you got out alive. Uh, and uh, Henny uh, Schuver, who is the Dutch ambassador to the United States, a veteran of the uh, Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs, now serving his third tour in the United States, including on the West Coast, and now twice in Washington, D.C. As you can see, we have uh, two uh, ambassadors who are uh, keen uh, observers of the transatlantic relationship and uh, know a bit about uh, the Washington and U.S. scene as well. Uh, we may be joined, uh, uh, um, uh, FDR permitting, by uh, Reka uh, Shermer Kenyi who's Hungary's, Hungary's ambassador to the United States since 2014. I'll say more about her uh, when she arrives. Uh, she's somebody I got to know personally when I, I was serving in Warsaw, and there's an opportunity for me just to say that I'm a former CFR denizen, first and foremost, a former policy planner at the Department of State and former ambassador to uh, Poland, and now dean at the School of Global and International Studies at Indiana University uh, Bloomington. So just some ground rules, apart from the usual uh, turn off one's phone and things like that. Um, but the main ground rule, which may strike fear into the hearts of our sitting ambassadors, is that um, this event is on the record uh, and live streamed. Uh, but um, uh, that said, as this audience knows, we have here among us some of the very best representatives uh, to Washington. And I thank Richard Haas and colleagues uh, for the opportunity to join you today. 
so let's begin with some recent news. Uh, Friday, last Friday, the EU and Turkey uh, reached an agreement on a very ambitious and uh, not uncontroversial deal that seeks to limit uh, illegal immigration flows to Europe in exchange for the prospect of uh, visa-free travel for Turkey and progress in EU membership talks. Um, maybe starting with uh, our Dutch colleague, does this agreement have any realistic chance of holding? Um, the answer is yes. To a, to a certain extent. Uh, let me say two or three things about it. A, it's very good that we have a deal. Uh, we have been looking for a deal for a long, long time. We have the presidency, the Netherlands, of the EU. At the moment, uh, my prime minister has been very active uh, on the scene. And we were, when we acquired, or when we got the presidency, 1st of January of this year, we have two major problems on the refugee crisis. One was in uncontrolled flow of refugees coming in to the EU and secondly was when they are in the EU what do we do for an equitable distribution of the refugees over the countries in the EU and we established very quickly that we could not answer the second question everybody participates in uh, receiving the refugees if we did not answer the first we have to have a controlled flow of refugees coming into the EU, and that's what we focused on. We cannot have our borders be controlled by gangs uh, in Bodrum or uh, on the Turkish coast or in the Libyan coast or whatever, who basically, what they used to do with other substances or, let's say, no, substance is not the right word, but these are people who have been trafficking for a long, long time. They traffic drugs be before, now they're trafficking human beings. It's a trait for them. We said, okay, we cannot have that. Uh, so we wanted to make a deal. The only country where you can make a deal with at the moment for this purpose is Turkey. The refugees coming mainly from Syria, from the Syria, Iraq uh, area, Turkey has to be in the mix. Uh, so that's why we were very happy that we now have a deal with Turkey. Turkey, by the way, who has already something like in between two and a half and three million Syrian refugees in Turkey. Uh, so they know what it is to receive refugees. And we have received in Europe last year one and a half million roughly refugees. We want to have a controlled flow. We now have a deal that offers us the possibility of controlling that flow. Uh, and I think that is very important because then we can come to the second question is how are we going to divide the refugees in Europe? So we're very familiar with this kind of issue in the United States, and I'm not referring now to the presidential uh, uh, campaign, although I, I, I will get to that. <laughs> but, you know, the, the question of how to regulate uh, in, in a humane way uh, in, in many senses of the word, the flow of refugees into the country is a difficult one, and striking the balance is, is quite difficult. But uh, do you feel like uh, this arrangement will allow for a continued flow of uh, uh, refugees who are uh, fleeing uh, really some of the worst uh, imaginable conditions uh, in Syria and to achieve uh, refuge uh, uh, in Europe? May I make one observation to start off with? You in the United States are familiar with immigrants, not with refugees. There's a big difference between refugees and immigrants. A refugee cannot go, go back. If we send somebody back to Aleppo, he might be killed. So we cannot send back refugees. Immigrants, either coming from Northern Africa or in your case from Mexico, you can send back. We have made treaties on refugees which said you are not allowed to send a refugee back. That's a big, big difference. So we are slightly, I won't say in a bind, but we are in a different, different situation here. Do I think that it will work? Um, it's too early to, uh, to tell, let's be honest. I think it will depend very much on the willingness of the Turks uh, and the Turkish government to work with us. Secondly, it will work very much 
Uh, it will depend very much on the willingness of the Europeans to put a border security guard in place, which we're trying to do, four or 5,000 people within a month to be able to control people. We always, it's not that we're building a fortress Europe. We are receiving them, we are looking who they are. If they are true refugees, they will say, if they are undocumented illegal refugees, they go back to Turkey, and then you know that the exchange system one, let's say, illegal Syrian, and we'll take a legal Syrian back. Um, and if they are immigrants, economic immigrants, they'll go back to the country where they came from. Uh, so it is an enormous process. It's really, it will re require a gigantic effort of, on the European Union side to control this. But we have made a blueprint. At least we have made a blueprint. We know what we're going to do. Can be implemented. I hope so. Well, thank you. And of course, your government has played a leading role in, in trying to find a, a, a humane solution that's sustainable over time. Um, if, if I could uh, maybe uh, uh, talk to uh, our British colleague um, uh, about um, when our Hungarian friend uh, arrives, we'll, we'll try to I integrate her into this discussion as well. But um, what about the future of, of Schengen? You know, really, uh, we were discussing uh, just before uh, this meeting how it, this is really at the very center of, of the European experiment. And of course, there are provisions when one can close borders temporarily, and, and that's taken place. But we've heard a lot of different statements from uh, different kinds of European uh, leaders and governments, none represented on the stage uh, at this moment, uh, with very varying attitudes about uh, how to respond. So. Um, is, uh, is Schengen finished? Is it viable? Are, are there efforts underway to rethink Schengen and what it ought to look like, uh, given the realities that um, uh, Europe is facing? Well, thank you very much for, for inviting me to CFR. It's very good to be here and see so many people. Uh, I will answer that question, but can I just first of all say a quick word about Turkey? Absolutely. Uh, and the EU and, and, and migration, uh, because there, there are I mean, there are many things that we need to do, but here, here are three things that need to be done in order to help tackle the, the refugee and migration crisis in Europe, and they all involve Turkey. Uh, the first is to solve the political crisis in Syria that is the source of so many of the refugees coming into Europe. There is no way that we will reach a political settlement on Syria without Turkey's full involvement. Uh, secondly, we've got to find a way of keeping as many uh, refugees and migrants as close to Syria as possible so that when peace does come to Syria, and it will eventually, that those, those Syrians can return to their country and help rebuild that country. And that is why at the London conference last month on, on Syria, uh, we paid particular attention to Turkey as well as to uh, Lebanon and Jordan. Uh, and between us, the international community was more generous than we have ever been on a single day. We pledged $11 billion uh, on one day for one issue, which we've never done before. Uh, and Turkey was a significant part of that. Again, because we want to allow refugees who come out of Syria to stay as close to Syria as possible for the, for, for the day when it returns, and th when they can return. And thirdly, uh, if we are going to tackle um, the, the, the migration and refugee crisis in Europe, we need to change the business model of the human traffickers. We need to put them out of business. Uh, we need to make it disproportionately difficult and expensive, in all senses of the word, for them to carry on their trade, which is, uh, which is causing such misery. Uh, and again, we cannot do that without Turkey. So uh, that's why I think that the European Union was right to, uh, to reach out to Turkey and to do this very difficult negotiation, uh, the implementation of which is ahead of us. Uh, but I think uh, the idea of it uh, was a very positive one. Now on Schengen, I'm probably not the right person to ask because the UK is not in Schengen uh, and uh, it's not in the Euro. Uh, and Schengen and the Euro are the two big integrationist uh, experiments or steps that the European Union has taken in its history. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, Schengen is the border-free travel within, uh, how many countries is it now in continental Europe? Anyway, it's, it's, it's Continental Europe. Continental yeah. Europe is 26. No, but, uh, how many are in Schengen? It's not, uh, uh, 21. It's, right. So 21 countries in, in Europe where once you're in one of them, you can travel around the rest of them without a, without, without a passport. Uh, and the UK being an island, uh, we've always had a different balance, if you like. We've always had a, a just culturally, we've, we've, we've had a, 
uh, a tougher test to get into uh, the, the country uh, traditionally, but then once you're in, we have no tests at all. We, we don't have a tradition of police being able to stop people on the street and just ask them to see, to see their ID cards or anything like that. Which is, and, and it's an opposite tradition in, in, in parts of uh, continental Europe where uh, it's relatively easy to get in, but once you're in, you might get stopped uh, by a policeman uh, if you look as though you aren't from, uh, from, from that country. Uh, and that cultural difference uh, is one of the reasons why the UK has never uh, signed up to the Schengen uh, Agreement. Uh, is, it, is, it, uh, is it destined to fall apart? No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. But I do think that uh, you know, extraordinary times require extraordinary measures. And so having some form of flexibility uh, at difficult times in order for individual nation states within the Schengen area to re-establish those border controls, that must make sense just in terms of the, of the politics of Europe at the moment. And so if I could ask my uh, Dutch colleague, who is directly affected, uh, what, his, what your thoughts are about this. Um, Schengen is part of, let's say, still, I think, the DNA of the European Union. It's one of the four freedoms on which uh, the European Union is built. And I must say, Schengen has already inbuilt in its system some, in any case, levers for if things go, will become very, very difficult, like you can suspend Schengen for a six-month period if uh, it becomes very, very troublesome. It is clear, I think, to everybody at the moment that Schengen, we have to take a closer look at Schengen and see if it's still viable for uh, the present uh, EU. But uh, I totally agree with my British colleague, uh, Schengen will not go away, so to say. Schengen is a part of why the European Union is the European Union. I'm coming from a country which is a trading nation. I can tell you we do 40% of the inland water transport and 25% of the road transport. Schengen is vital for us. Um, and w while, we're, while we're with our uh, uh, Dutch colleague, um, I had a question for you about something that may not be on everybody's radar screen, but which we also talked about uh, in advance a little bit earlier. Um, just in a few weeks' time, uh, there'll be a referendum in uh, April on whether the Dutch support or oppose the uh, EU-Ukrainian uh, association agreement. And right now, uh, things could change, but right now it looks like the no votes are, uh, are uh, ahead, or it's close, depending on what polls you look at. Um, you know, there was an extraordinary um, unity across the Atlantic mm -hmm. in the response to the... Uh, uh, illegal annexation of uh, Crimea, and we talked about the two-year anniversary of the occupation. Uh, so um, uh, wh what does this say about Dutch attitudes towards the situation in Ukraine um, uh, about, uh, and uh, is it that uh, people uh, in the Netherlands have lost confidence in the ability of uh, the Ukrainian people to get their act together? Uh, is it a sign uh, uh, that people are more preoccupied with the issues we're discussing at home? Uh, are people looking to improve relations with Moscow or what? How, how are we to understand this? Well, I don't think certainly not improve relations with Moscow because you might remember we are the country of the MH17, the plane that was shot down over eastern U Ukraine where 192 of my uh, fellow citizens lost their lives uh, and we have a a certain idea of who might be behind it. Uh, the, that report will come out in the summer. Um, so it's, it's, it underscores my idea that I don't think this is a referendum on the association agreement with Ukraine. This is a referendum on our relationship with the EU. And um, that's the problem with referenda. They, very seldom go over the actual issue. They are hijacked by people and there's another issue put in front. And this, I think, is a general issue. Are we happy with the way that we are being governed by a distant body in Brussels, which is distant from The Hague, our capital, and is one up from The Hague. And it's a little bit... Uh, you know what they make these association agreements without actually consulting us, which is not true, because the government has to approve and the parliament has to approve, but still there are things happening in the EU which are happening without 
us having a direct influence on the decision making process. And that's unfortunately, and I think telling is uh, they have a guest speaker, a big uh, thing going on on the 1st of April, and guess who's the guest speaker, speaker coming from the UK, Nigel Farage, who has nothing to do with U Ukraine and everything to do with the relationship between the individual member states and the EU. And that's why he's been invited, because that's the real issue of uh, the vote. That's very interesting. And, and um, perhaps that gets us uh, to uh, 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 other questions about the relationship with, um, with Europe and the EU. Um, uh, a question with which, Ambassador, I know you are no doubt ready to answer. Uh, uh, looking That's forward to, the, uh, <laughs> to um, the, the upcoming referendum, yeah. which um, the, the Prime Minister has announced. Uh, on whether Britain should remain in the EU. The vote is, is, uh, is just around the corner. I should say my wife is a Scot. Yeah. Um, uh, she refuses, by the way, to get her American citizenship, but I'm, I'm working on that. Um, but I, do, I, do, I am aware of how uh, families are uh, among themselves divided on some of these kinds of questions, even where you might not expect uh, divisions. So these are very deeply felt uh, issues, I'm sure. So. Um, I guess the first question I might have for you is, um, what does the uh, deal that uh, the Prime Minister achieved with the EU have uh, uh, on, the, uh, on the British electorate? Thank you. So yes, so the UK has a referendum that really is about our relationship with the European <laughs> Union. Uh, and it's on June the 23rd, so it's only three months away. Uh, and uh, Prime Minister Cameron secured uh, an agreement with the uh, other leaders of the European Union uh, and it's on the basis of that reformed relationship with the EU that he strongly supports uh, the UK remaining in the EU. Some of the highlights of that agreement, uh, first of all, this phrase, ever closer union, uh, will not apply to the UK. This, this has become a totemic issue uh, for large parts of Europe because uh, it's used as a, uh, as a reason for continuing the tide of, of continual integration. Uh, and so removing that uh, from, from applying to the UK means that there's no reason why the direction of travel needs to continue to be towards integration. There could just as well be um, a move back, a flow back from, of power from the European Union level back down to each of the member states. Uh, secondly, there are protections for the pound uh, and the City of London. Uh, as I said earlier, the UK has not joined uh, the euro and uh, will not do so in the foreseeable future uh, and uh, the Prime Minister secured uh, arrangements that allow uh, the UK conti to continue to use the pound and for uh, us not to be um, uh, biased against in any uh, agreements uh, amongst the countries that use the euro. Uh, then there are um, issues related to the migration debate that we've just been talking about uh, and essentially it'll make it'll be harder uh, for certain categories of migrants entering the UK to um, to be paid benefits from the state before they have paid into the state uh, and there are there are a whole load of other um, points but those are some of the key ones at its heart, this is, this is a question about the future identity of the United Kingdom. Do we see ourselves as, as a country that wants to remain in the EU or do we want to leave the EU? Uh, and as you suggest, Lee, this is a divisive uh, issue uh, in the UK. If you look at the polls, the, the, uh, the latest uh, are broadly 50-50. Uh, some recent polls, in fact, have the leave uh, vote uh, edging ahead. Uh, if you look at the bookies, uh, if you follow the money, uh, you will see that they continue to think that the UK will vote to remain in the EU. Either way, this is a huge choice uh, for the British people, uh, including those who live uh, abroad, provided they register in time. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's coming up just around the corner. Uh, if we vote uh, to leave, we will leave. Uh, and there is only one way to leave when there's an article in the, in, the, in the EU treaties, Article 50, that gives a two-year period for a negotiation. So if we vote to leave on June the 23rd, then we will leave uh, the EU uh, within those two years. There is a possibility of extending that negotiation if it's ne necessary if every single country agrees, but for the sake of argument, it'll be a two-year period. If we vote to remain, uh, we will need to continue uh, to reform 
uh, the EU, not just on the areas that I've mentioned, those three, but also in things like competitiveness, you know, making sure that the EU gets rid of uh, the red tape and the bureaucracy uh, for which um, sometimes it is, it is known, uh, making sure that as the largest single market in the world, uh, that it can really play its uh, part uh, in the world economy, in the global economy. Uh, and you can sum up the case for remaining in the EU, which is the government's case, uh, that uh, in this new uh, reformed EU, the UK will be stronger and safer and more prosperous uh, by remaining in. Hannah, how, how is this issue viewed uh, from uh, your perspective in terms of uh, the debate and the, the, the possibility that uh, Britain might well uh, leave the EU? Um, two things. A, the Netherlands has always been a very strong uh, advocate of the UK in the EU. We were the ones who, when the, e, when the UK wanted to join the EU, have been fighting against the French who were opposed. Uh, we wanted an ally in the EU, an ally next to the Germans and the French. We are very close to the EU. It's one of our main trading partners. But more importantly, we think the same about a number of issues, internal market, uh, international trade, etc. So uh, I think that it's maybe uh, telling that the deal was made during the, the Netherlands presidency. Uh, there was a lot of contact. Um, we think that the deal is fair, uh, very much uh, in your vein. I'm a Dutchman, I'm, I'm a cyclist. Uh, I know that if you stop pedaling uh, at a certain moment, you will fall over, unless you're a very accomplished cyclist and you can do surplus, <laughs> as it's called. But okay, you don't, uh, we'll keep that up forever. Um, that's a little bit what the EU has been. Eh? We have been going on with making laws and more laws and more laws. And I think at a certain moment we have to take a step back and say, you know what, is this is all we have been by now descended to the level of uh, legislating the size of uh, olive oil bottles. Mm -hmm. uh, not necessary anymore. So how will it be perceived? I think we would very much like the, e the UK to be in there. Uh, I think the UK would be very well advised to stay into the EU because still it's more than 50% of their exports go to the EU. Uh, they are in the end, although being an island and when the, the fog is there, the <laughs> continent is isolated, mm. uh, but uh, they are a European country uh, and they have been part of our European history. So I think for very many reasons, I think the UK should stay in and we would like to have a friend uh, in the EU debate, which we have. Yeah. Uh, I'll ask one more question and then I'd like to uh, open it up to our, our colleagues in the, in the audience. Um, there's a lot of talk. There was a recent article, an interview with, um, based on an interview with President Obama in the Atlantic. Um, and um, over the course of the eight, last eight years or seven years, a discussion about the, the nature of the transatlantic relationship, the deg degree to which the United States has focused on that, uh, the degree to which the United States has turned its attentions uh, uh, elsewhere. Um, I'd like to engage you a little bit uh, in, in this discussion. Uh, uh, and uh, in light of the challenges that the EU is facing, from your perspective, um, the directions you would like to see uh, transatlantic relations headed in the future. And uh, as a footnote to that, the degree to which the um, elevated debate during the um, American presidential campaign um, uh, affects uh, uh, your views about uh, the, the prospects for the future of a, a close transatlantic relationship going forward. And uh, perhaps we'll go in reverse order, please, sure. Matthew. I, mean, I, want, I want to kick off by talking about my day job, which is British Ambassador to the United Nations. I spend most of my time in the Security Council because the UK is one of uh, five permanent members of the Security Council, uh, and another is the United States. And the, there are 10 non-permanent countries at any one time. The 15 of us sit in alphabetical order. The UK is always next to the United States. So Samantha Power, my American opposite number, uh, sits right there. And we you know, pass each other notes and uh, 
say little jokes and things uh, in each other's ear during the, during the boring bits. Uh, and for me, that is the embodiment of um, what I don't know if we're allowed to call a special relationship, but certainly a very close transatlantic relationship where we don't agree on everything, but we agree on a huge amount. Uh, and where we are stronger, uh, the closer we are able to work together. Uh, and uh, certainly for all of my diplomatic career, I've been brought up really as a diplomat thinking that the UK interest is best served by having a strong, um, not, a, not a completely uncritical, but a strong uh, relationship with the United States alongside our relationships in Europe. Uh, and that is what we seek to do at the Security Council. Uh, and I think many in Europe uh, are still trying to get used to the idea of this, uh, of this leadership from behind or whatever phrase you want to use, um, that particularly in the Middle East. I mean, that's the area where in the past uh, successive US administrations have been much more directive, uh, including with their European allies, about what exactly the right answer is. Uh, and that hasn't always been straightforward by any means. Um, and of course, you have to be careful what we wish for. But I think a lot of Europeans had wished for a bit more space uh, in the Middle East. And I think it's been very difficult uh, for, for them to fill that space. Uh, and as a result, I think we are still trying to get used to the idea of how best uh, the European powers, particularly uh, the UK and France as permanent members on the Security Council, but, but all, of the, all of Europe, including countries like the Netherlands, that have a, such a strong and proud record externally outside the borders of Europe, making a difference, making, making, making the world a better place. Uh, and I, I just think it's still up in the air. And of course, there's a lot of uncertainty this year as we, as we look ahead. Just finally, just bringing it back again to the United Nations, uh, I think the fact that we don't know what is going to happen next year is an argument to get done everything that we can this year. We know what we have this year. We have what is probably the most pro-UN engagement uh, US administration uh, that any of us can remember. Uh, and so we may as well get on and use that um, uh, alliance in the in the UN and elsewhere uh, for maximum impa impact in 2016. Thank you. Um, our generation has grown up with the certainty of a transatlantic relationship. Um, this was forged after the Second World War, where, let's say, my country was liberated by the Americans and the Canadians. Uh, the biggest war grave outside, uh, I think, the US and, and maybe England is in the Netherlands, where more than 8,300 Americans are being buried. So we were over, there was the certainty of the transatlantic relationship. Um, I think that certainty, and we have to be honest, after 70 years, more than 70 years after the end of the Second World War, we cannot keep counting on that certainty, not meaning that the United States will leave, but I think that we have to get into a different gear to know that the United States is like with your parents. They will not always be there. Uh, the United States will not always be there. Um, so I think that we have to uh, rediscuss with the United States the relationship between Europe and the United States. Secondly, um, we have scolded during the Bush period uh, the United States for a too interventionist policy. Now we are scolding the United States under the Obama period for a non-interventionist policy. What we would like to see is that the pendulum swings and stops in the middle, uh, from here to there and now in, in the middle, uh, where we will have to play our part as Europe and especially as exactly as Matthew said, uh, yes, there is time. Uh, there is a space for Europe. We have to redefine de de the space for Europe. So thank you very much. And we have a very dramatic entrance. Reika shermer Kenyi from uh, Hungary, uh, my uh, a former colleague uh, and friend, um, who uh, was, uh, has been ambassador to the United States from Hungary since 2014. The very interesting career in and out of think tanks as a consultant to the World Bank, an expert on energy with uh, experience in the private uh, energy uh, sector. And as I said, pleased to have been a guest of mine uh, at, at my uh, residence once upon a time in Warsaw. Uh, we've been talking about a lot of things. Uh, and um, uh, you just arrived. So we'll just uh, uh, ask a question or two of you and then give our, our colleagues uh, in the audience a chance to, uh, to talk. Um, uh, we were, we began our discussion about migration 
And obviously, um, um, uh, your government's had some specific views about migration uh, and uh, uh, the refugee crisis that's affected all of Europe. And um, I guess uh, our, our question for you uh, would be um, uh, how your government's views uh, on this issue, in light of some of the statements of, of President uh, uh, Orban, uh, differ from uh, some others. Uh, he's had a stronger, a much stronger view, obviously, about um, whether or not it's wise for Europe to continue to let immigrants in. And maybe if you could talk about it in the context of the recent deal uh, on Friday between the EU and Turkey uh, to stem the flow of illegal migrants into Europe and the degree to which that begins to address some of your country's concerns. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And I apologize for being late. We were sitting on the uh, tarmac for about an hour and a half, two hours in Washington, D.C. They wouldn't let the plane leave. So I apologize. And just instead of landing here at 4 o'clock, I <laughs> really ran in from the airport. But I very much appreciate the opportunity and the very kind invitation. And I was very much looking forward to, uh, to the discussion because I think it's really very, very topical and very important that we do try to understand each other as best as possible because the... Um, Challenges are immense, I think, and the uh, uh, consequences of all the decisions that we're making today are going to be with us for the next 15 to 20 years, definitely. So I think this is a very, very important uh, topic. And um, thinking back of your wonderful residence in Warsaw, where I really had the pleasure and the honor to have been hosted several times, so in, in retrospect, at those times, I think we would never have thought that we were going to face the challenges that we're facing now in Europe. And the problem of course, I think in many ways is that the way we understand it in Central Europe, and you can see it increasingly uh, sort of um, being put into practice as well, is that not only is this a challenge that is unprecedented in European history and something that has never uh, uh, occurred to uh, any of the uh, uh, countries or the continent uh, in general, um, I'm sure you have spoken about the numbers, but I think the, the ones that we have been feeling is that uh, in comparison, of, of course, the um, 391,000 people that have entered through Hungary, because we have been really on the land route for uh, the migration wave towards uh, the, uh, the continent, uh, if you compare it in, in population ratio uh, of Hungary to that of the population ratio of, of the United States, that would equal a good 1. Uh, uh, oh, sorry, 12 million people uh, coming into the United States within 12 months uh, without papers, without any uh, documentation, uh, the large majority uh, and uh, a large majority not very willing to cooperate with the registration process as uh, uh, we have been uh, witnessing this uh, of a certain after a certain point. The problem, of course, and the challenge that comes from this massive wave of people uh, is not only that it hit us also in many ways unprepared and uh, the logistical uh, help that we had to set up took some time and of course it took a lot of uh, effort to understand the real needs of these people. Uh, but also what we could see is that um, there is a, such a massive raise, a r range of uh, challenges uh, that come with this massive wave uh, that we have to be understanding very clearly every single one of them uh, to be able to develop the right answers. First, of course, what came under challenge was the, the, uh, the freedom of internal movement of the European Union. And that, I think, is what we could see increasingly uh, most recently, the, uh, uh, the, the biggest achievement of the European integration process, something that you know, left, right, up and down, all across the European Union, is the thing that everybody appreciates most, to have that passport free travel uh, ab uh, ability. Um, of course, the uh, security challenges are massive also. What you could see is the, uh, um, uh, the lack of uh, understanding of the security concern has been characteristic of the discussions in Europe. And I think that really shows the need for more security uh, sort of um, finesse and more security understanding and, and uh, awareness of the importance of these. And Europe had been in a very com comfortable position for the last uh, 50 years, if I may say, of not really having to focus on strategic issues and thinking all the time that all the security challenges are going to kindly avoid, avoid the continent 
and hit the US directly, or hit the Middle East, or hit some other parts of the world, but not us. So this, I think this period is definitely over. And I think uh, what comes with it is a challenge of the political stability of the continent, which you can also see that there is a massive imp uh, repercussion for the, um, uh, uh, for the mainstream parties as well, which are seen as unable to develop the real answers for this, the, the solution. So you can see the increase of fringe parties in Europe in many countries across the board. I think if I may say just two more, or you know, uh, the, the two more sentences on what we think is the problem with the current situation is that what you can see in the, as a result of this uh, sort of multiple level challenges and pressures, uh, it is very dangerous to see the discussions that are going on in Europe. Because what you can see is a number of uh, misconceptions or some say illusions that we're living with or that we're discussing uh, since the beginning of this uh, refugee crisis. First was that uh, the first uh, sort of misconception or, or illusion, if you, if you like, is that this is just a, a ref refugee crisis, so the answer has to be humanitarian. Well, no, we can see that this is a, a lot more complex crisis, so the answer cannot be simply and solely uh, humanitarian. It needs a lot more understanding of the real uh, character of the, of the crisis. Um, the second is that the, the, the migration crisis is what we have seen in the continent. The migration uh, crisis is what we see is just another problem in front of us and we solve it by distributing the refugees in the EU and then move on. Well, in our understanding, the first wave of the migration crisis is what's behind us. It's not slowing down and it's not over yet. We're seeing a lot more to come. So this year is going to increase the, the challenge and the pressure is going to increase. So it's a grave error to think that if we distribute the current numbers of people, uh, fine, we're, we're good. And we can uh, sort of see to the next uh, challenge of the continent. The third big misconception, I think, uh, is that um, what we could see also, especially in the media, if, of course, that not allowing everyone in Europe is cruel and xenophobic. I think it's just a, a very dangerous misconception because obviously nobody is saying that uh, all the migrants coming into Europe are terrorists. It's, it's, it would be very silly, but it's, it would be equally silly to assume that none of them have any links to uh, organizations that are uh, unfriendly to uh, the uh, uh, security structures of our, of our countries. And the fourth, I think, which is also getting into, we're getting into the more sensitive part of the discussion, is that um, we had this very massive misconception of the, uh, uh, in the European context that the opening of the borders will create a seamless, integrated, multi multicultural society, happy, early living together ever after. This is really very sensitive and touches a number of issues that are uh, non-PC probably, but also that are, uh, clearly visible on the continent. One of this, I think, is that what we have seen is the development of a, 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 in several countries and in several places of parallel societies. It's not the type of um, uh, social structures that we have been thinking of when we were talking about uh, you know, uh, multiculturalism or the integration of these people. And definitely, uh, the EU track record on integration is you know, mixed at best, so I think we have a, a lot to think about. And what we can see is that the, the harming of this social cohesion is uh, going to have other repercussions for the political stability in the, con on the, in the countries of the continent as well. Um, so with this as opening, if I may say, <laughs> just a, a, a few food for thought, I think it's very important that we do sort of start to discuss the real issues that are developing on the continent. All right, well, we appreciate your perseverance and, and coming here, and you've added a lot. Uh, so uh, I'm going to suggest that we go straight to the, uh, our colleagues and see how much we can squeeze in in the next 15 minutes because I know we're on a tough clock. So uh, uh, sir in the back and please uh, wait for the microphone, identify yourself and I'll keep uh, a list. Um, uh, Herbert Levin, a council member. I appreciate uh, the remarks about how to handle the flow of people from the Middle East, et cetera. I wonder if I could ask you to look a little bit uh, further into this question, um, and you may, you may correct my question as being a poor one, and that is there are only three countries in that area with internal coherence, the Egyptians, the Turks, and the Iranians, 
uh, the uh, Egyptians uh, are without influence uh, elsewhere because of internal incoherence, uh, and that would unfortunately be the case for the foreseeable future. They also are not a menace to anyone. The Turks uh, have a lot of coherence uh, and uh, uh, have uh, quite a view, if you've been in Ankara, they have quite a view as to how to handle uh, Arabs uh, because they have an imperial inheritance. And the Iranians, uh, some of us are not preoccupied with Shiaism. They've been there a long time and they have a view how to handle uh, the Middle East, which may not be our view. But the point is, you're not going to have any coherence in that part of the world unless the Europeans, and maybe even the Americans, understand you only have three real countries to work with. Would you please tell me why my question is very stupid? <laughs> <laughs> let, let me, uh, for the sake of speed uh, uh, and, and getting a number of uh, commentators in given the limited amount of time, Go to our, our second questioner right here, front. We're taking notes. We haven't forgotten your question. Thank you, Alan Blinken, former ambassador, United States to Belgium. Um, I was in Belgium when President Clinton suggested the entrance into NATO of Czech Republic, Hungary, and Poland. I'm wondering with the possible weakening of the EU, are there any cracks in the togetherness of NATO, which protects us all? Okay, and we're gonna do one more right here, just so you don't have to walk across the room. Thank you very much, Leticia Garriott. Um, you mentioned keeping refugees close to Syria. Can you share more thoughts on the idea of extraterritorial processing of visa? in Jordan, in Lebanon, versus in-country processing once the refugees have reached Europe. OK. Would anybody like to take a, a stab at the Middle East question? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll hold that until the end, but I, I'm not, I, we won't leave that one uh, lying. Uh, the questions are about uh, NATO cohesion, and uh, particularly in light of the newer members. Uh, please. I can do the NATO. I've been for three years uh, director of the private office of uh, the Secretary General of NATO uh, between 2006 and 2009, so NATO is dear to my heart. NATO has an enormous advantage uh, being uh, a very focused organization. It is about the defense of the transatlantic sphere. So I think that uh, NATO is far more coherent uh, in a way than the European Union is. Um, NATO uh, has a real enemy again. Uh, I think when I was there, the problem was that uh, who is the enemy and there was the, the peace dividend and how are we gonna divide the peace dividend. I won't say that I uh, am very happy with what's happening in Russia, but uh, it has given the NATO uh, a new sense of purpose. Uh, uh, I think that the main question at the moment NATO for NATO is uh, where will our emphasis be on the eastern flank or on the southern flank? Uh, is there a role for NATO to play in uh, the southern flank of Europe? Is there a role for NATO to play in the Middle East peace process and in the end would there be, let's say, boots on the ground if there would be a, some sort of a solution in Syria or in the Middle East peace process? And up till now, NATO is very hesitant uh, in that. Uh, the Eastern question is very simple. It's an Article 5 question. We are, or some NATO members are being threatened from the East. Article 5 says, if you are attacked, if one of us is attacked, we will all defend you. That is rock solid, and therefore I think NATO will be here to stay for a long, long time. And Rekha, if I could ask you, does, does your government also believe that uh, it has uh, an enemy again in Russia? Of course, what has, has been happening in Ukraine over the last two years is definitely something that has hit and has hurt all of our national securities. That's very clear, and that's 
so clearly uh, a problem for the international legal system and thinking that we have that we have to respond to. And we definitely are interested, of course, with every uh, one of, uh, member of the uh, North Atlantic Treaty Organization that we have to work together and that we have to strengthen our common transatlantic security area uh, as further as uh, we go along in history. We are very much uh, sort of the transatlanticist uh, uh, trend in, in domestic politics as well, so I think it's very uh, clear. There is a very clear other understanding as well, I think, that is also important, is that what we would like to see is that we need to make sure that we will sort of work for a situation in which uh, Russia is going to come back to being a partner uh, in which, uh, with which we can cooperate. And I think the relations between um, Russia and the NATO countries is really on so many multiple levels that Ukraine is one of them. The fight against ISIS is another one. In, uh, Iran and the questions of the Middle East, of course, are yet uh, another aspect of this. So I think it's a very complex relationship in which um, we have multiple stakes. We also have seen that uh, the uh, dependence that we, ha we had in, on Russia in the energy sector is not something that is easily Changeable. We have been working on this. We would have needed, of course, uh, uh, a stronger international sort of cooperation of the understanding of this dependence. Uh, but we're still living on this uh, as landlocked countries. You know, there's few of us, but the, the ones that are landlocked uh, have a different situation from those that have access to sea and that can develop their own access to the world markets on energy imports as well, which is what we could see in Poland with the development of the Svinoysha terminal uh, or in the Baltics as well. I think, you know, geopolitics does matter in, in, in energy, of course, uh, also. So, yes, we very much uh, are interested in strengthening the uh, uh, security area that we live in. This is why I think we have been fighting for before 1990 as well. And uh, at the same time, we would like to see a Europe in which uh, the regional network of the European sort of energy infrastructure as well helps the stability of the entire continent. Thank you. Matthew. Uh, let me briefly try and answer all, all three, starting with, uh, with that point about Russian energy. Dealing with Russia is the worst single issue for the EU in terms of foreign policy because the national interest of the different EU countries is so divergent because our energy dependency from Russia varies from 0% to 100%. Uh, and in other words, some EU countries are completely dependent on Russian oil and gas and others are not at all dependent. And so creating a single common policy on sanctions or how to respond to, to Russia's annexation of Crimea or, or its um, occupation of, uh, of eastern Ukraine, <coughs> there is a very different starting point uh, for each of the EU countries, which is why it's been so difficult and yet so important uh, to, to reach, to forge a consensus. The UK view is very firmly that, I don't think we use the phrase enemy to describe Russia, but we do think of Russia as, a, as our biggest strategic threat, one of our biggest strategic threats. Uh, and it, it is a threat. It's a threat to NATO. It's a threat potentially to the territorial integrity of countries other than Ukraine, uh, some of which are in NATO. Uh, and it's absolutely crucial that the answer to your question is that no, NATO isn't crumbling. Uh, and I very much agree uh, with our Dutch colleague that, that, that NATO must respond uh, to any um, uh, possible threat to, to, to its territory. Um, in terms of uh, coherence ac across the Middle East, I mean, I, I guess I want to start answering that question with the same point, which is about Russia, is that if the US and, and Europe fail to uh, tackle the various issues in the Middle East, including the ones that you raise, then we are opening up a space unnecessarily uh, to Russia to have a, a bigger role. I do agree that Russia played a very helpful role uh, on the, getting the Iran deal uh, and continue to play a role, uh, which is occasionally helpful in tackling Daesh or ISIS, uh, but giving them an additional role uh, on Syria, I think uh, is uh, potentially a thin end of the wedge uh, that could create more problems for us in, in the future. I agree that you know, dealing with Turkey, dealing with uh, Iran, dealing with Egypt are all complicated, but we do have to deal with the world as we find it. Uh, and you could perhaps have mentioned Saudi Arabia. Uh, I don't know uh, where, how you categorize that, but they are certainly a very important uh, power in the Middle East uh, still, uh, and we do need to uh, engage them in order to find a solution in Syria, uh, as well as in, in Yemen and, and elsewhere. And then finally, this is your, uh, asked a good question about um, 
essentially why, I think you were saying, why does the UK want to take uh, refugees directly from Syria or from the neighbouring countries uh, and do the screening there rather than allowing them to come through Europe? And the short answer to that is that we want to be generous, uh, but we don't want to increase the so-called pull factor. We don't want to give a, yet another reason for refugees to start flowing out of Syria or anywhere else uh, ev eventually to, towards the UK. And our concern has been that, uh, that Europe collectively had on occasion increased uh, the so-called pull factor and we need to get around that by trying to uh, take people directly from either within Syria or from those neighboring countries. So that, was the, that was the reason. All right, we have time, I think, for one more uh, question. Yes, please, sir. Hi, David Preiser. So uh, <clears throat> I'm keenly uh, interested in the distinction the panel has drawn between uh, migra migrants and refugees uh, on the theory that nature abhors a vacuum. Uh, to what extent do the persistent low birth rates in Europe uh, play a role in this uh, migration as opposed to refugee uh, activity? Uh, yeah. Um, there are a number of countries in Europe who have a very low birth rate. Uh, one of them is Germany. Uh, I think everybody knows that Germany, I think at present, has 88 million people. And if they go on like this, um, it's not... Uh, uh, cry for the Germans to close their curtains earlier and start uh, pro pro uh, juicing but still if they go on like this they might come close to 80 million in the not too distant future so yes we have an aging population uh, in Europe uh, countries like France Italy Spain are in the same uh, uh, problem uh, so we need uh, I won't say replenishment but we need in order to keep our social security systems, which are different than what you have here, if they, in order to keep them viable, we need, let's put it bluntly, we need taxpayers. Uh, we need people who do the work for us uh, and who make our social uh, system that we have built over the years, uh, make that viable. Um, implying um, that um, Angela Merkel, when she said, wir schaffen das, um, was basically inviting uh, immigrants to come to her country in order to maintain her population rate goes too far uh, for, for, for me. I think that there was a genuine feeling with Merkel that uh, there was also a moral obligation to house people who are refugees and who cannot uh, come, come, uh, come uh, of go home. That the fact that there were people coming into Germany who were maybe highly educated and could replenish the workforce was a good deal for some companies. Definitely true. That's why, let's say, Germany got close to a million people, uh, which is enormous. Uh, the public outcry in Germany, despite the, uh, uh, the rise in uh, popularity uh, of the more extreme right-wing parties, has still been subdued. Uh, there is not a revolt, uh, re revolt in Germany, despite what you might read in, in certain newspapers. Uh, I think that Angela Merkel is still probably the most popular politician uh, in uh, Germany, but the fact is that if you take in one million within a year, it takes time to uh, to uh, settle. Uh, and uh, in the long run, this might be a good move for uh, Germany. Uh, in the long run, to getting uh, a million extra people might be the right move. But okay, that was, I don't think that you can say that was the reason why Merkel said bring me a million people. Well, we are uh, unfortunately right at uh, 7 o'clock. There is uh, much more we could talk about. I utterly failed to get any of my 
ambassadorial colleagues to comment on the American presidential elections. <laughs> uh, but perhaps we'll be able to hear more about that later on. But please join me in thanking uh, our panelists. Thank you.